At Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time, but once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion, and if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice, or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us, so that in the service time, when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. I get the privilege uh, to lead off our Easter series. Um, next week, Pastor Paul is going to teach about um, Palm Sunday, because it's Palm Sunday, and then he's going to teach about um, the following week, Easter, because it's Easter. And so this week, I get to talk about the week before Palm Sunday. I get to talk about somebody you may have heard. His name is Lazarus. So I'm going to be hanging in the book of John. Now, the Bible's separated in two different parts. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament. We're going to hang out in the New Testament in one of the Gospels called John. And um, I kind of want to look at this this story a little bit different. A lot of times when we hear stories in the Bible, sometimes we feel like, I don't know if it applies today, and, um, or we just read it because we're supposed to. But I kind of want to peel it back from a different perspective and look from a friendship perspective. Because in this story, there's four main characters. There's Mary, there's Martha, there's Lazarus, and there's Jesus. Now, the interesting thing about this friendship is because it really was a friendship. So much so that when Jesus was ministering two, three miles away, he would make a point to travel to Bethany to spend time with his friends. And I'm sure they laughed together. I'm sure they ate together. And you guys all know your closest friends, you laugh together and you eat together, right? And so I feel like these are like Jesus' closest friends and he hangs out with them. So we're going to kind of look at it from a different perspective than just reading the Bible. Let me pray. Jesus, again, thank you for Sundays. And um, I pray that when we leave here today, that we hear your heart, that we hear your voice. God, be with us and um, help me uh, to be able to clearly speak your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I grew up in the 1980s and the 1990s. And um, we, had, uh, we didn't have something that is really relevant in today's world at that point. The only kind of one that there was was on Saved by the Bell. It was this massive thing. It was a cell phone. Like, I have a cell phone. In the world we live in today, everybody has a cell phone. My seven-year-old has a cell phone for games, but he still has a phone. Like, we didn't have this when I was a kid. Raise your hand if you were born 1982 or before that. Raise your hand. 1982 or before that, I see some kids are like confused here. But anyway, so like, so, so for me, when I grew up, like I had to like do stuff. Because there's this, kids, there's this thing called outside. And so like it's a place you go when you're not inside. It's out. And so we used to have to like find things to do outside. And I grew up outside Chicago. And one of my favorite things to do was to go out in the country and find like an old abandoned home and kind of, and like nobody lived there. And I would like go in and like look through the windows and then we'd like, because I just love homes. And so we'd like go and like spook each other. Well, there is like this one house that supposedly had like this, this dead guy that lived there, which is totally not true, but, but that was kind of the story. And so we went in there and we're kind of like scaring each other, you know, kind of thing. And then I had an idea. I was like, hey, bingo, how about you and I stay here? And then our other friends, there's like three or four of them, we're like, you guys go into town, get as many friends as you can and bring them back to the house. And they're like, yes, this would be amazing. We're gonna scare them. And so, so they all left. And so bingo and I are hanging out in a creepy old house by herself, which is weird. And anyways, so about an hour goes by and uh, we see lights heading down the driveway. And so we run upstairs and we look out the window and there's about 12, 15 kids coming into the house. And we're like, this is gonna be awesome. And so like they come into the house and they're kind of scaring each other at first, you know, you know kind of things. And, and then Bingo and I, we start like walking across the floor very softly, but walking across the floor. And then you can kind of hear them get quiet. And then when we were kind of stamping our feet just a little bit that they could hear it, they were, they were starting to like freak out. They're like, ah, you know, kind of thing. They're like, hello, hello. You know, they're starting to yell. Well, you know, like you always want to end big, right? And so I grabbed like a coat hanger and I threw it down like the stairwell case and everybody goes, ah! 
and they like run out. Like football players, girls, didn't matter. Like everybody screamed. They ran out. I ran with them laughing so hard. It was the greatest moment of my high school career, and you could care less about it. But I loved every moment of it. And because there was a story about a dead guy that came back to life, but that was not a real story. Here's the segue. I'm going to tell you about a story that a dead guy did come back to life. It's in John 11, okay? Like the segue. Thanks, Paul. All right, so he told me that. Kudos, buddy. All right, so John 11, we're going to hang out. And um, something I, I really want to do, something we really lean on a lot on Sunday nights and on Wednesdays nights with our kids and um, weekend services is we spend time in the word because this is God's word. So in John 11, um, we're going we're gonna to kind of read it kind of verse by verse a little bit. We'll, I'll do some overview stuff, but we'll kind of hang out in John 11 today. Verse 1, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. In parentheses, in verse 2, it says, This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Verse 3. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. i us sit on that for just a sec. When, when I hear the one that you love, I don't know if you know this, but... Um, in the Bible, there's only two people that it's ever said that about. It's Lazarus in this story, and it's also about John, the guy who wrote the book of John, because he wants extra brownie points in heaven, I think. But, but, but in all seriousness, there's only two people that it's said about, and I really feel like it tells the closeness of this friendship between Lazarus, John, and Jesus. And in this case, it's Lazarus. Verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it, Jesus says. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Verse 6, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, if I knew, like, my best friend Bingo back in Chicago was sick, I'm going to do whatever I can to get there to be with him. Um, if, if I knew that my, my father-in-law, who is the closest representation of Jesus I have ever seen, was sick, I would do whatever I can to be with him in Des Moines, Iowa. I would do whatever I could. But not Jesus. Jesus decides to stay for two more days and for me, it begs the question, why? Why does he choose to stay for two more days instead of just leaving? He's like, oh, my buddy's sick. I'm going to be with him. And that's not what happens. He decides to stay for two more days. If I could go, I would be there. But Jesus decides to stay. In verse 7, it goes, it says, and then he said to his disciples a couple days later, then let's go back to Judea. So verse 8 through 16, there's this dialogue that happens. Uh, the dialogue that happens is um, the, the first kind of debate breaks up. Because the last time they were in Bethany, there was uh, people that were mad at them. They wanted to kill Jesus. Like, Jesus, don't you remember? Like, people wanted to kill you. We can't go back there. And Jesus is like, no, 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 my, my friend is, is asleep. And they're like, well, isn't sleeping the best thing that should happen if you're sick? And they're like, no. Jesus is like, no, he's dead. So number one, if you're taking notes, is Jesus waits. Jesus waits. So if you have a sucker still with you, um, if you want to raise it up in the air and wave it around like you just don't care kind of thing, reference. Um, here's the thing. If you keep that sucker and you do not open it up, I know this is crazy hard, but you don't open it up because here's the thing. Everybody loves a dumb dumb, right? And so like everybody, that's quotable. Um, everybody loves a dumb dumb. And, and so, like, it's so hard not to open up a sucker and, and eat it. But here's the thing. If you do not open the sucker, even open it, smell it, whatever, if you do not open the sucker and you leave the auditorium at the end of the service, you will walk out with two suckers, okay? Ooh, that's pretty good, huh? And so here's the thing. This is why it's the greatest Sunday ever. You came into Sunday being like, I don't even have a sucker. And then now you have a sucker, right? 
And then at the end of the service, you might have two suckers. Greatest Sunday ever. Apparently, I only care about it. So Jesus waits. Here's the thing. Why doesn't he do something right away? Why doesn't Jesus do something right away? In John 4, just a few chapters over, it talks about this man that comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, my son is sick. And Jesus asks the man, do you believe in me? The man says, yes. And Jesus says, go home, your son is well. He's made well. And at that moment, he's healed. With one of his like, best friends, why doesn't he at least do that? Why doesn't he at least say, your son, or, or my best friend, like, he's healed, everything's fine, it's no big deal. Why does he wait? Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss of their brother. In verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Verse 21, Martha says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Again, peel this back, these are friends. These are people that ate together. These are people that hung out together. These are people that probably played games. They, these are friends. And he says, or excuse me, she says, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Your friend wouldn't have died. It's almost like she's saying, why didn't you come through? You came through for that person, but you didn't come through with your friend. And it's almost like in verse 22, she makes a pivot because she says, you know, if, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But in verse 22, she says, but I even know now that God will give you whatever you ask. So it's like, why weren't you here? But even if you did something now, everything would be great. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And it's like Martha knows theology here. She says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the third day. Verse 25, we'll come back to this verse a couple times today. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. Not only that, but he says, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe? Do you believe? So what happens in the next few verses from 28 to 31 is um, Martha goes back because Jesus wants to talk to Mary. And so Mary gets up and she heads out. And so there's a group of people that's with Mary. Now in that time, um, when uh, a loss had happened in her life, like a, like a tragic event, was there was a group of people that were mourners. They were professional mourners. Like, how would you like that for a job? You know, if you're sad, I got a job for you. You know, like, like, you know, like but this, this is what people did. And so if you had a lot of money, you had a lot of mourners. And if you had a small amount of money, you only had a small amount of mourners. And so these people get up with Mary because they think she's going to the tomb and they follow her, but she goes out to Jesus. Verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. It's like this was the topic of conversation, I'm sure, as they're sitting around the dinner table. They're saying, where was Jesus. I thought he loved me. I thought that he loved Lazarus. I thought he, he spent time with it. You think that he would do something. I mean, we're not just people he passes on the street and heals. Like, we are like his friends, people that we connect with, people that we're with all the time. You think that Jesus would do something. It's almost like this is the topic of conversation. And verses 33 through 36 is, I believe, for me at least, this is one of the most intimate passages about Jesus. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. For me, when I am deeply moved in spirit and troubled, you can see it on my face. My cheeks get really red my ears get really red and it's like they throb. My eyes get red 
and you can just see it. And I wonder if you could see Jesus' troubled spirit there. He's just so overwhelmed with emotion that he's in the moment. Moving on, it says, he asks, where have you laid him? And I wonder, just peeling back the scripture just a little bit, if there's a crack in his voice. Because remember, these are friends. And they, they say, come and see, Lord. And in verse 35, it says, Jesus wept. And, and I wonder if John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, if we could remember one verse in all of the Bible is John eleven thirty five 35, that Jesus wept. Verse 36 says, Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. Number two, Jesus wept. I think so many of us, when, we, when, when we've heard this story or when we've read this story, we think there's a single tear that falls down his face. But that's not what weeping is. Weeping is a, is a silent yell of tears. It's this can't catch your breath. That is what weeping is. And so many of us, we have this image that Jesus just has this shed of tear. And an and interesting thought is, spoiler alert, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus knows this. Why is he crying? Why is he weeping? If he knows everything, why doesn't he stand back and go, you have little faith. Why don't you trust in me? Why doesn't he do that? I mean, that makes sense. But no, Jesus is in the moment with them much like he's in the moment with you. I have three kids. I have a 14-year-old, Logan. I have an 11-year-old daughter named Abigail. And I have a, a 7-year-old son named Paxton. And um, 14 years ago, my son, my firstborn, was sick. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what to do. Um, it's, for you that know, it's really eerily similar to how, what my daughter was going through as well. But this was our firstborn. We didn't know what was going on. And he was breathing, but he couldn't catch his breath. So much so that when he was breathing, you could see his rib cage. Every breath he took. And I remember putting him on my chest and, and just praying for him and hoping everything would be okay. But it just got to the point where we had to take him to the doctor. And so we took him to the doctor and, and they put us in the hospital. And, and he was in there for a week and they were running tests and they're trying to know, figure out what was going on, what is causing this and why is he doing this. And he was breathing so hard that I remember the doctor said, I don't know if he's gonna make it through the night. And at 22, 23 years old, that just hit me. And my, my wife went into the restroom just to kind of hide her face and just cry. And the doctors had left and I'm in the, the ICU wing with my son and, and, and there he is, he's hooked up to all of this stuff. And I'm four feet from him, and I remember feeling like I need to be close with him because I don't know what's going to happen. And I walk to the crib, and I lower down like the gate thing, and, and so I, I actually climb into the bed with him. And I remember trying not to get on the hoses. I remember trying not to hit the wires, and I just wanted to put him against my chest. And I remember weeping, and I remember cry, like, like crying, not knowing what's going to happen, and just trusting and trying to trust that God's going to take care of us. And I also remember that moment that Jesus was with me. I don't know how to explain it, but I felt him next to me. That's 14 years ago. My story is still going on. My son um, made it. You know, he's, this is him. Um, this is Logan. Um, he, he loves me so much he dresses up like me. Um, <laughs> But he's 14. He smells like a 14-year-old. For some reason, girls are into him, which is weird, by the way. Can I say that? That's weird. But in that moment, Jesus was with me. He knew the outcome. He knew everything's going to be fine, but he's with me in the moment. And when I was weeping, he was weeping. In Psalm 34, it says, he is close to the brokenhearted. Pick up reading again, verse 37. It says, but some of them said, could not he have opened the eyes of the blind man and have kept this man from dying? It's like the skeptics come out now. 
It's like, yeah, so this, this you know, he, why didn't he do something? I mean, like, couldn't he have done something? I mean, he does everything else. Why couldn't he do this? Verse 38, uh, Jesus once more deeply moved. And I believe this is where it's like, okay, now you're going to see this. And he came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. In verse 39, he has the audacity to say, take away the stone. Martha says, but Lord, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor for he has been in there for four days. This is the reality of it. And uh, King James, it says he stinketh. Like, Lazarus stunk. I mean, like, he's been in there for four days. I mean, you guys get what I'm laying down? Like, he just, he doesn't smell fresh, you know, kind of thing. I mean, he smells, you know, we'll just stay. Okay, moving on. All right, so you get it. So he just smells really bad. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up, and he has a simple prayer. And his father, I thank you that you have heard me. He says, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Verse, four, verse 43, when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. If you ever had a dad or a fatherly figure, you want to just raise your hand and say, I've had that, right? Um, I, I think in some ways or another, we've all heard the dad voice, right? Now, now here's the thing. Women, I know that you, you um, were able to have the baby, but dads have a dad voice, which I think is about the same, right? I mean, for me, <laughs> makes sense to me. All right, Wayne's with me. He's nodding along. So, I mean, like, it's, it's like, you know, but I, I believe that Jesus calls out in a dad voice, and I have a crazy loud dad voice, and I won't, I won't show it off here, but, but I believe he's like, Lazarus comes out, come out. Lazarus, come out. And he just says this so loud and so thunderous. And says, the dead man came out, his feet, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Could you imagine when he says, Lazarus, come out, and you're standing there watching, and you start to hear something, you're like, you know, you're trying to listen more intent, like, what is going on? You know, kind of thing. And then could you imagine, like, jaws dropping as he comes out? I mean, put yourself in the scene. I mean, here comes this dead guy, and it doesn't say he stinks anymore. Like, it, like how does this happen? Things that I love about Scripture that jumps out to me is things like Jesus calls Lazarus by name much like I believe he calls you by name. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Verse 45, it says, therefore many of the Jews, last verse I'll read, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. So lastly, number three, Jesus works. Jesus works. Something I've noticed. Why not all? Why not all? All the people that saw it, why didn't they all believe? Why weren't they all moved? Why not all? I have a demonstration I'd like to show you. Um, we're going to have one of uh, my guys come up. This is, uh, I call him Tag. Everybody say, Hi, Tag. Tag helps me out tremendously every week on Wednesday nights. He's here loving on the kids. He is the games guy with Rachel, who's over there too. Um, they, they do our games, and they kill it every week. Um, Tag is totally okay to get slapped in the face with pancakes. Um, see, look at that face. And so um, also he comes on Sunday nights, and again, he's the games guy, and kids just love him. So thanks, Tag. Everybody get up for Tag. All right. All right, so I'm going to show you something, and, and uh, maybe some of you guys have seen this. Um, you know, if not, whoa, almost fell. Okay, so here's the thing. All right, so we have baking soda right here, and we have water here, and we have vinegar here. Now, if you know what's going to happen, just keep it to yourself, okay? Some of you guys are like, I already know it's not magic, and so that's totally fine. All right, so 
So we're, let's see what happens here, okay? So we put in the water. Not a whole lot happened. I mean, like, the water, you can see the kind of baking soda, you know, it's really cloudy now, but it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of the same. I wouldn't drink it, but it's kind of the same. All right, so now we're going to put in vinegar. I'll move it in the middle. All right, let's see what happens. Isn't that cool? I'll put more. Isn't that so cool? If it spills on the stage, I'm sorry, Jordan. All right, so, that is so, like, can you guys hear it? No? Okay, I can. All right, so it's like, like fizzing and all that kind of stuff. Here's, you want me to explain why this happens? Um, I don't know. I'm not a science teacher. I saw it once in science class. There you go, you know, kind of thing. That's why I became a pastor, so I didn't have to learn these kind of things or know these kind of things. All right, so that was a funny joke. Nobody really laughed. Okay, so anyways, um, the reason why, here's the thing. It's the same thing. It's baking soda in water. It's baking soda in, in, in vinegar. And I think that this is very similar to the text because I believe that some people were open and ready to receive God and some people were so much not that they went to the religious leaders and at that that same day or the next day they decided to kill Jesus. Talk about two polar opposites. You know, you have some people that are ready to follow him, you have other people like ready to get rid of him. And even Lazarus, they were like, well, we need to get rid of Lazarus too. It's like, why does this happen? Because I feel and I, I that there's this hardened of hearts, and some people are open and ready to follow Christ, and they, they saw a miracle, and they're ready to follow. So what are some takeaways? Even when you can't understand God, you can trust him. Even when you can't understand God, you can trust him. Here's the thing. Mary and Martha didn't understand why Jesus didn't show up. Or why he didn't at least do what he did in John 4. At least do that. At least just say, he's healed and everything's fine. Like, why didn't he at least do that? But you can trust him. When I went through my thing, I had to learn to trust, even though I didn't know what was going on. Even when you cannot understand, you can trust him. Secondly, even though God knows the outcome, he is not calloused to our pain. That's good. Even though God knows the outcome, he is not callous to our pain. He's walking with you. So many times we sit back and we think that he's like, just trust in me and everything's gonna be fine. Or, or, but he's walking with you. He weeps with you and he weeps for you. This isn't in your notes and I would love for you to write this down is what does this say about our God? A God that weeps with you. Thirdly, even when it seems all hope is gone, God still works miracles. Amen? 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 Even when it seems all hope is gone, God still works miracles, much like he worked that miracle in Lazarus, Lazarus's life. He can work it in yours. Lazarus was dead, and only through Jesus he lives. You may be sitting here going, you know, my marriage is dead. My relationship with my kids is not what it should be. You may be sitting here thinking like, you know, that's all great and all, but at school I sit by myself. Nobody even noticed. If I didn't show up at school, nobody would notice. God still works miracles. Lastly, Eternal life is only found in Jesus. It's the only place where it's found. Eternal life is only found in Jesus. In John eleven twenty five, 25, we went over it. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And a couple chapters over in verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 6, he says, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, in our student ministry on Sunday nights, we always kind of end with the big idea. 
So what's, what's this whole thing about? Like, like what's my takeaway? What, 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 it, what can I learn from this? So your next steps, begin the process of trusting that God sees your pain. Because I'm gonna be honest, it is a process. It's a process to truly trust that God sees it and, and not just that he sees it, but he's with you during it. And lastly, put your faith in him so you can have that life in him in you. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you for Sundays. Thank you for a chance to connect with you. Thank you for, thank you for a chance to be moved by you. Got to pray that for someone in this room, and, and maybe it's multiple people, that when we sit back and, and we hear this story from a different perspective of friendship and a different perspective of, of that you loved them and how similar it is to us that you love us. God, give us the Lazarus story in our life that we were once dead, but now we are alive in you. And so if there's anybody in this room that's at that place of saying, you know what, I need to start trusting in the process. I need to start believing in him, believing in Jesus, believing that Jesus is the eternal life is only found in Jesus. If that is you, I'm just gonna count to three. And if that's you and you're at the place of going, you know what, I need Jesus to do a resurrection in my life. I'm gonna count to three and if that's you, you're just gonna slip up your hand. Nobody's gonna be looking around. And I believe at that moment, Jesus comes into your life. I believe in that moment, Jesus starts to change your life. Here in a few moments, Pastor Paul's gonna set up communion and communion will have a different taste, a different look in your life that once you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. One, two, three. There's hands going up all over. You can put those hands down. Jesus, I pray for each and every one of these hands that went up and for the hands that went up inside of their heart. I pray that you move, you empower, and you embrace them. Let them know that you're walking with them in their grief and in their sorrow. That you're not a God that's just so far away, but you're a God that's intimately close. And you want to change us and to become more like your son, Jesus. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. If you're watching online, either because you're sick and can't make it or out of town, or maybe you watch online regularly, let me invite you to, while we are celebrating communion here at Family Church, to take and take a few moments and celebrate communion right there in your own home, if you're able, or wherever you might be. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of a teaching on it and just kind of help us understand it. But if you have a possibility of going and getting a cup, um, picking up some crackers, a uh, loaf of bread, something that you can take and physically participate in this as we go through the process, it will be meaningful to you. And how you get the elements and what you put them in and if it's grape juice or wine or whatever you want to take, it's, those, those details really are not the point of it. The point of it is this is a spiritual exercise of, of examining ourselves, of reviewing what the truth is and the and, and it's a spiritual moment that the scripture speaks of very highly. And so I'd like to lead you through that um, wherever you are right now. And if you have somebody or if you're able to, to go ahead and grab some crackers and grab some juice, then when we get to the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for you just to take a few moments as we are here at Family Church and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So I'd, I'd like to read, first of all, from 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is writing to a church that's actually doing it all wrong. And he's kind of trying to correct them. And so he brings in some things to, to bring this back to a point of worship. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So Paul wasn't there. He didn't come to be a follower of Jesus till after that. And so evidently Jesus had communicated to him that this is how he was supposed to, to remember that what had happened. 
And so he, Paul, like us, wasn't there in person. So this is his way of reviewing and remembering that. And so it says, Jesus broke the bread and then he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To proclaim is to to share something as true and to, to again review it and remember that. And so he's saying, whenever you go through this exercise, you are reminding yourself, you are saying, wow, this is what happened. And and Jesus' body was broken for me, and, and his blood was shed for me, and I am now a part of the family of, of God. I am now forgiven. I am now included because of what Jesus has done. And then he goes on and gives a little warning. He said, So then, whoever eats the body or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And and he's dealing with a situation where they actually had a whole love fest, a a big feast, and and some people were coming and they were hungry and they were elbowing their way in and they were getting a lot and it it turned into a, a, a kind of a wild party. And he was saying, man, that is dangerous. You've forgotten what this is about. But, but it's also a great reminder for you and I that before we take this moment and remember Jesus in this special way, he says we're supposed to examine ourselves. What, what is my relationship with Christ like? Is there any sin? And I, and I think it's often appropriate just to stop and to pray and to say, God, is there anything in my life that's hindering you working? Is there... Is there anybody I've offended? Is there anything that I, maybe it's a sin you clearly know that you committed and you just need to confess it. And and maybe you think, I I don't really think of anything that I've done specifically that was an act of sin, but you allow the Holy Spirit to point out where you've been selfish or where you've been misusing the the resources God's given you or something that the Spirit points out. And that's that's part of the function of not only examining yourself, as it says, but, but doing that and letting God examine you so there's that moment of, of kind of humility and of, of prayer and of asking God to show you and, and offering up and saying, God, thank you that your, your blood is sufficient to cover that sin too. I, I confess, I, I blow it all the time. I'm, I'm a sinful person. And thank you, God, for forgiving me. And, and, and you go through a period of time and examine and, and confess and, and kind of like clear the plate. And I, I think it's impor- important for us to do that daily, but... It seems like when we celebrate communion, there's kind of a, a big moment where you're saying, okay, I want to clear my heart. And then, and then he says, we are to remember the body and blood of Christ. And I, and I think as you go through and as you take that bread, you, you think about cross. You think about Jesus saying, not my will, but yours be done. And, and about his body that was, he was whipped and his the crown of thorns. And, and not to become gruesome or to focus on the gory part of it, but but to realize that it, the cost that it was for him, this, this is a free gift for me, but ah, the cost was incredible. And, and, and when you think of the blood and the fact that it was shed for me, that that's the only way that sin is forgiven. And in the Old Testament, it was a lamb that was killed and the, the, the throat was slit and the blood was put on the altar. And that was a picture of the cost of sin. And so as you remember those things, you, you come to that moment of, not only soberness, but it's, it's, we call it a celebration because you're thinking, wow, this is so incredible. And so you take that and and then I encourage you and and I'd like to just pray with you. And then when we're done praying, whenever you're ready, you you take that bread and you take that cup and you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I, I remember you, I take this and you, you eat the bread and drink the drink from the cup and, and let it be a, a spiritual moment for you. So I'd like to lead you in prayer and, um, if, if you'd like to spend a few moments after that uh, examining your heart and seeing if God would show you anything that you need to confess and then, and then go ahead and eat and, and drink whenever you're ready. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who are joining us online. And, and Father, all of us have things in our life where selfishness comes in and where bitterness comes and where, where we allow fear to control us instead of you. And I ask that you would... Just lead us, God, to confess whatever it is that might hinder our relationship or you working in us. 
And then I ask that as we eat this piece of bread, a cracker, as we drink this juice or this wine, that, that we would do it as an act of worship, remembering and reminding ourselves how valuable and how important this is and, and saying how grateful we are to you. But God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us this, this symbol to remind us because we are a forgetful people. In your precious name, amen. Now as the music continues, just go through that process wherever you are in that and we'll trust that this will be a special part of your worship today. Thank you.